verses 2 through 11. Uh, there's some extra Bibles underneath the chairs if you'd like to follow along with uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. You know, a little trick to follow, find Philippians is uh, GE Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So, GE Power Company, right? So, from Philippians chapter 1, let's, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you and are thankful for this uh, time together. Thankful for your presence in our life. Thankful for the grace of Jesus. We pray, Lord God, by the power of your Spirit, uh, you would draw us to you. Uh, you are the, the source of all strength, hope, and a future for us. And so draw us to yourself and teach us now from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're talking uh, in a series about the joy of Jesus and this joy in partnership. And um, I'm thinking about uh, how you greet someone uh, says, a, says a bunch, and I think if we're honest with ourselves as Americans, we kind of greet each other pretty flippantly. Like, we just kind of, you know, we come up to say, like, how are you doing? We don't really expect an answer. Uh, in fact, a lot of international students, when they first come here, they notice that. Like, we don't really care what the answer is. It's like, how are you doing? And we're, we're shocked if someone would actually say to us, instead of just, like, okay or fine, if they said, uh, I'm actually terrible. You know, we don't, we don't expect that. Or, and, and, and then we wouldn't even know how to deal with that, and, and maybe I need to listen to them and, and talk to them and really interact with them. Or we, we might greet uh, somebody with, what's up? Or, how, how are things going? Uh, you know, what's happening in your life? Things, things along that, that line. Well, other cultures greet people in different ways. So the Greeks, a common greeting that the ancient Greeks would use was joy, joy to you. A common greeting that the Romans would use is health, health to you. Uh, another, a greeting that the Jews would use and still use is shalom, which is peace. So Jewish people would say shalom, peace. Uh, now, the Apostle Paul uses None of those, uh, initially. Initially, how does the Apostle Paul address the Philippians? He says, grace and peace to you from God and our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is what he starts with. Grace is the starting point uh, that he uses. Grace is what God gives to us. Uh, we can't have peace with God unless grace comes first. Grace is the gift that God has given to us to restore our relationship with him. Grace is what opens us up to a relationship with God. Uh, the Apostle John in uh, the Gospel of John said this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he goes on to say, For from his fullness we have all received grace, Upon grace. See, the advent of Jesus breaks into this world of ours, which is full of all kinds of things, brokenness in many ways, a hatred of, in many ways, a discord that occurs, and, and a selfishness, a self-internalization, a self-turning to ourselves. Um, and he, he breaks into this world of ours, not to pour out wrath upon us. In fact, the, quite the opposite. What did Jesus do? He took the wrath of God upon himself on the cross in our place. And instead of pouring wrath out upon us, we receive from Christ grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. All that we receive from Christ. And so when thinking about this, we don't have grace in our life. Peace isn't there. But if we know the grace of God found in Jesus Christ, we can know peace with God. We can know peace with each other. If there's no, no grace. There's no lasting joy. We're not anchored in anything. But if we know the grace of God, we can know joy in our life. 
if we don't, if, if we have no grace in our life, then we have no health, particularly in terms of our spiritual condition, our spiritual health. We have no lasting spiritual health. But if we know the grace of God, then we have spiritual health in our lives. So all of this is, is what God initiated. All of this is what God has done. So Paul starts in a place where relationships need to start. And as receivers of grace in our own life, this gift from God, that needs to be the starting point of our relationship with others. It's grace. Not our, not our starting point isn't, well, uh, I'm going to look at that person, I'm going to make a judgment on them. No, our starting point is grace. We receive grace, so our starting point in our relationship with others is grace. And so that's where Paul starts, with grace. Beautiful, undeserved, unmerited grace, favor from God. It's, you know, it's not our ethnic foods that, that draw us together. It, it's, not, uh, it's not our likes of certain sports that would draw us together. Ultimately, it's not the color of our skin. It's not our politics. It is grace that binds us together as brothers and sisters. It is the fact that God has adopted us into his family, drawn us into his family, that then makes us brothers and sisters and part of his family. We have this deep connection now as family under the blood of Jesus Christ. So Paul reiterates that again when he's speaking to the the Philippians in verse 7. He says this, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I told you in my heart, I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of what? Of grace. That's what has bound them together, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It binds us together in a partnership that is much deeper than natural likes and dislikes. So if you have some relationship with someone and it is based on common likes, and over time, let's say that your common like that you had with that, that, that person, you kind of start going off in a different direction. What inevitably happens to that relationship that was just based on common likes? You start to drift apart. You start to go apart from each other. Not so when grace is what binds us together. When the grace of God found in Jesus Christ binds us together, that is a much deeper level. Grace brings a deep partnership that stands the test of time, that stands the test of circumstances in our life. It is not broken by time. It is not broken by circumstance that happens in our life. Grace brings us together and binds us together through good times and bad times. It binds us together when we laugh and when we cry. Grace binds us together when we dance and when we mourn. Grace binds us together when there's war and when there's peace. Grace binds us together when the whole world wants to divide us into us and them. It binds us together. Grace is why Paul, though physically separated from them, he's sitting there in a prison cell, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians with joy in his heart because of grace. And he says to them, in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. How easy it is for us to look at people in worldly terms. What do I mean by that? We look at someone and we'll make a judgment call on them. Whether it's somebody 
uh, that ha what, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. We look at them, what their faults are, and we're making an analysis and judgment on them. And even when we look at their strengths, we, in worldly terms, when we're looking at someone's strengths, we're seeing it from our perspective, like what can their strengths do for me? How can I benefit from this? So that's how we kind of start looking at people from worldly terms. What do I get out of all this? What's in it for me? But we no longer do that when we look at people through the eyes of grace. Grace, the good news that we have this partnership based on the gospel that you, have, you and I have received grace upon grace poured out on us, undeserved. Yet it's the good news. In fact, it is the best news we could ever share with anyone. This, this good news that is found in Jesus. And so a group of believers that is focused on bringing that good news, the grace upon grace that is found in Jesus, will have a partnership of joy. That's it. They can't help but have that. That's what exudes from a place that has experienced the forgiveness and the grace that is found in Jesus Christ and this partnership that we, we have together to bring the best news to a hurting and broken world around us. The good news. So we, begin, we share this. And grace, as it brings us into this partnership, it changes our life for the sake of the kingdom of God, how we interact with people. And uh, for good news, you know, when you think about good news and that coming to our life, some people kind of think, well, that good news is for that moment in which they came to faith in Jesus Christ. And that certainly is good news, right? Good news is somebody comes to faith in Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. We're here in partnership together to weather the storms of life and we need grace upon grace every day in our lives. In partnership and in fellowship with each other, we need each other through the storms of life. And so we've been given that, uh, that, that tremendous gift, and we receive that, and in partnership we live that out together. The reason Paul is, is uh, sure that the good news that they first received in Jesus Christ uh, will be brought to completion is because God's faithful. He's going to accomplish what he started. He didn't save you to abandon you. He put you here in a body of believers so that we can go through this life and go through it not just kind of I'm making it through life, and someday I'm going to die. No, I'm, we're in partnership together, living an abundant life together. Together, working through this life, knowing that God loves us and has forgiven us in Christ. And that partnership bears fruit then. You see what the Apostle Paul says for, in verse 8. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You see what the fruit of this partnership is. He says that your love may abound more and more. That in Christ, in this grace that has been poured out upon you, that our love for each other would abound more and more, would grow more and more, our care and our love for each other. And he says, also he says that you will have all knowledge, increase in knowledge and discernment. So this ever-increasing knowledge of God is found when we're working through things together under the word of God, wrestling with these things and discerning what God's will is for your life and the gifts that he has blessed you with. And you, we, we can work that out in the body of Christ. So where someone can say, hey, you're really gifted in this area. Have you considered 
um, considering following God's will for your life in this particular area. Everyone is gifted in a different way. We work that out in community, in partnership with each other uh, as we study God's word together. And then thirdly, he says that we may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So there's an ever-increasing desire in the power of the Holy Spirit to, to know the truth and to follow the truth of God's worth that he's revealed to us in the scriptures. And we encourage one another to follow that truth all the while knowing that once in a while we're going to stumble and fall. And so we need to lift one another up to offer grace and forgiveness as we're going through this life trying to live this out as God has called us to live this out. This changes lives. You know, just, uh, just recently, uh, we remembered the anniversary of the attack, um, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and in that, um, there's an amazing story that, that comes out of that. Uh, one of the architects of, of the attack on Pearl Harbor was Mitsuo um, Uchido, Uchida, probably pronouncing that wrong, uh, he was the uh, Japanese, uh, one of the architects of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And um, after the war was over, they were having trials for war crimes and the way people were treated in prison. And uh, Fuchido saw this as complete hypocrisy because surely someone would treat their enemies the same way the Japanese treated those who they had interned in prisoners. Surely that would be the case. But then he heard that uh, those who were in prison, Japanese prisoners in American camps, were treated differently. They were, they were, they were afforded uh, certain privileges and things that were treated more humanely. Uh, but he, he couldn't really wrap his head about that, around that. But he, he said, like, why would that be? Why would they treat their enemies differently? Fujita found his answer in, in 1948 at a Tokyo train station. An American missionary was handing out pamphlets titled, I Was a Prisoner of Japan. It was written by Jacob DeShazer, uh, one of General Doolittle's raiders who bombed Tokyo as a retaliation for the attack on Pearl Harbor in, right there in 1942. Soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor, they wanted to strike back, and so they basically sent them on a basically a suicide mission. Uh, and DeShazer's uh, B-25 bomber then crash-landed in China, and he was taken into prison by the Japanese. And, and for, the, for the next... Uh, uh, 40 well, he was ex he wanted to go on this mission because he was extremely vocal to Shazer in his hatred of Japanese of the Japanese. He declared that if he could only get his hands on the guy who had led the raid on Pearl Harbor, he would slit his throat. That's where he was at at that time. And so, as it turned out, though, because of this raid and his crash landing in China, the Japanese got their hands on him, <laughs> and he was thrown into a prison camp for 40 months, and so for the next 40 months, DeShazer was starved, he was tortured, he was beaten, and he was kept in solitary confinement, all of which increased his hatred of the Japanese. But then a guard, of all people, a guard in this prison gave him an English Bible. And DeShazer, as DeShazer read this, he joyfully surrendered his heart to, to Jesus Christ, to following Christ. And he began treating his captors with respect and love and forgiveness instead of the belligerence and hatred he had towards them. And after the war, DeShazer went back to America, went back to the U.S., trained as a missionary, and he returned to Japan to share the gospel, the good news that is found in Jesus Christ with his former enemies. It is estimated that some 30 
thousand Japanese came, citizens became Christians because of his personal ministry, including Mitsuo Fuchida, the architect of the one of the architects of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the leader of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And in 1950, after Fuchida had received that pamphlet from DeShazer, who didn't know he didn't know him at the time, he just received a pamphlet. He came to faith in Christ, and in 1950, Fuchida sought out DeShazer. The two former enemies embraced each other as brothers and spent the rest of their lives witnessing together of the power of Christ and his grace and his forgiveness. Only God can do that. Only God can take hatred that is in someone's heart and turn that to his glory. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of grace upon grace that you and I have received. That's the partnership that we have. The good news that is found in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you have poured out upon us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it in any way. Right now, Lord God, there's some of us that are holding on to hatred in our hearts, to unforgiveness in our hearts. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us strength, supernatural strength to forgive those who have hurt us. And by the power of your grace that we would, in partnership and in, and, and in encouragement to one another and in joy, share this life-changing message that in Jesus there is forgiveness, that in Jesus we have found grace upon grace poured out upon us, that in Jesus we are bound together with something much deeper than just our likes and dislikes. We praise you and thank you for the work that you've done in our lives and the work you're continuing to do. Work through us. May our love abound and increase more and more for each other. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So let, let us uh, stand and confess our faith in this mighty God and all he's done for us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord.